thanks for listening and watching DIY for business. It's so weird to say watching and, and I'm still not used to the like camera just popping on us here uh, after the new cool <laughs> open. If you haven't checked us out, do it. Go check us out on YouTube because <laughs> you'll see the weird reaction. Just watch for that. As Billy Sorry, Crystal Nick. used to say, Russ, you look marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got the uh, I've got this like cabbie hat on, so I look like I'm about to uh, either go play golf, be a caddy, or be a cabbie. Um, drive oh, a taxi. Yeah. That's, one, that's one of those things. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. But I like it. It's a good look. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, my 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 brother was wearing this hat. I'm like, well, you know what? We look so much alike. It looks good on him. So I guess I guess I'll do it. I'll, I'll go <laughs> for it. <laughs> you mentioned cabbie, right? Uh huh. And I remember like. I remember seeing like when I go to San Francisco before there would be so many cabs. Oh, right. You like, like tons and tons of cabs yeah. and bicycle delivery guys. <laughs> right. And down the financial yeah. district, there was so yeah. many different bicycle delivery guys. Latest visit to San Francisco. I really noticed that I don't see yeah. cabs because mm -hmm. they're everybody's Uber or Lyft. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't see the bicycle delivery guys anymore. I know. I miss the bicycle delivery people. Uh, they, they were so cool because like, you know, they're, they're just flying down the streets or like I had to use those all the time working in the city. So we worked, uh, the, the radio station I worked for was right next to the Transamerica building, which yeah. is the big pyramid in the, in San Francisco that you see on all the postcards. Uh, and you know, we would have to get stuff like commercials and whatnot. We would produce a commercial and we'd have to get it to a client. And so we'd use these bicycle messengers and they would come by, they would pick the thing up and they would race it down there. I don't know how they did it, but like it would probably take me 20 minutes to get this there. Like within 10 minutes, I'm getting a phone call. Okay. We heard it. It's good. I'm like, what? Yeah. No, they're they like, would they're just so fast. in and out of cars dangerously, yeah. but they, somehow oh, they, yeah. you know, they lived and they didn't yeah. <laughs> get well, too Well, that's the other thing. You're, you're, you're not getting almost hit by the bicycle messengers. Yeah, in the city that's true. Anymore. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I wonder well, if they even have them anymore. Is there a need? I mean, you can do everything. Well, you know, with COVID right? during San Francisco just totally changed the financial district. I mean, it it's, it's it there's just, yeah. I don't know, a fraction of the employees that actually are going to the offices. I know there's a big movement right now to try to get some of the employees back um, into the offices. But after COVID, I don't think yeah. you really need them anymore. Well, you know, I've been going to the city. I probably went to the city more over the last like six months than I did since before COVID. Um, and what I've been noticing is every time I go, like each, if it's like, it's almost like a gradient of, of additional traffic, like in the beginning, like in March, April, very light, like I could get anywhere. I could park anywhere. I could do whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's getting much worse now. And then hearing like just traffic reports on the radio, like uh, right. they're going a little bit longer now. It's, it feels mm -hmm. like people are returning, but then, you know, you look at some of these office places. Like I drove, uh, I, I went by, um, uh, 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 like where Facebook is and Google down in the right. South Bay, right. Parking lots are still empty. So still empty. I, I don't know if it's just now transition to people not taking public transportation because of COVID or that because public transportation is not that great right now, or what, you know, like there's, it's pulled back a little bit, or if it's, other businesses going, you know, to places. I, I, don't know. I don't know. Well, like you mentioned on BART, which is the public transportation system that goes in the city, you know, you can grab a seat, no problem nowadays. Oh yeah. But, yeah. but also you know, there's just not that many cars on the streets either in the mm -hmm. downtown. Well, you know, what used to take us a half an hour to get, get onto the freeway from, you know, maybe a mile away or even the half a mile away. Now it's like zip right on. So it's, I think it's just a lack of people downtown right now. And I think yeah. you know, San Francisco is going through its transitionary period and, you know, hopefully um, it'll bounce back because it's a beautiful city. I love San exactly. Francisco. I lived there for a while and, um, you know, I, I wish the best for the recovery of San Francisco. I think it does the Bay Area and does the world good to yeah. see San Francisco, you know, back to its brilliance. Right. Well, you know, I, I talked to just just yesterday, I talked to uh, these two tourists that were coming in from Utah and uh, they lived in Ogden, Utah, like nicest people I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting. Like they were like they were so cool. They were parked next to me in a parking lot and they started chatting with me through the window, asking me questions. Hey, do you live here? And, like, you know, and so I'm answering questions about where to go and if it was worth it to go to this spot or that spot because they didn't want to do the touristy stuff. 
right. you know, um, they just wanted to do some different things. So I gave them some suggestions and we chatted back and forth a bit. Um, and then I go, you know, I got to ask, do you think like you hear about San Francisco on the news? And I'm sure you heard about that before your trip. Did that change your mind in any way? Or when you got here, did it change your mind about what the city looks like and how it's, you know, and she gets, and, and uh, the, the wife was uh, uh, very upfront with, I was shocked at the amount of homeless like that. That was, that was bad. However, everything else, it seemed like, it seemed like it was fine. So it's this weird thing that I think we see it like sort of in a microscope because we've seen it before and after we're seeing all the different stages. And so we see that it's, you know, sort of in not a great spot right now, but also I think that San Francisco is sort of amplifying not just the problems with other cities, but perhaps problems with businesses. I think a lot of people are going through transitions right now. I think a lot of people are needing to pivot and make change. And it's not just the big cities and, you know, even the smaller cities, but it's also the the, the small businesses, the medium sized business, even the, 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 the big clients that, uh, that I, you know, that I've had, uh, they're going through big change. So it's, right. it's kind of interesting to, to do that. Um, yeah. And maybe just maybe, We've got a guest that'll talk about that with us today. Oh, oh, guess what? We do. Uh, Jason. <laughs> hey, guys. Hey. Smooth intro. Um, oh, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think you were talking about the messenger bikes earlier. And I, I remember one of the first things when I moved to San Francisco in 2009, went for four years, I remember seeing those Timbuktu bags and being like, oh, yeah, wow, okay, yeah, yeah. this is what it's about. And right. um, having those messenger bags that just throw over to carry a ton of stuff and just yeah. uh you know it's it's sort of a representation of uh, part of san francisco culture uh, yeah. that hopefully we can you know find a way to 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 honor and represent even maybe the needs are different now yeah right. that's true that's true well we yeah. did a really smooth intro but we did a really poor job of telling everybody <laughs> who you are so please introduce yourself and tell everybody what you're doing right now yeah. So my name is Jason Shen. I am an executive coach. I work with unconventional founders and leaders who want to chart a course through change and swing big at stuff that matters. Nice. Love it. Nice. So uh, let's uh, let's get into that a little bit. Um, I, I, f I feel like uh, this is like a, just a hot topic right now because Greg and I were talking before this and we both had conversations about this, about how like people are pivoting in their businesses and, and, and making change. So what are you seeing right now? Uh, just kind of in the landscape, let's, let's just sort of dive into that. Yeah. So, you know, I work with a lot of, uh, you know, early stage startups or just people who are inside the tech uh, community. And mm -hmm. obviously both from the, you know, I was working at Meta previously and a lot of the large tech companies have left folks go um, or they've, you know, changed up their focus areas. They've retracted uh, some of the more expansive ideas that they were doing. I mean, the Flexport CEO, they, he just, mm -hmm. he just came back in and took back the, the title. It seems like a lot of companies are, you know, can't help but do that. Right. Like you see Starbucks, you see Disney, um, you see, uh, you know, there's just, just these companies that, that can't resist. I, I mean, is Jeff Bezos going to come back to Amazon uh, but, but so that's certainly at the big company level, you see some, some more focus on, on like the core business or just like a, a, a different direction from this other period. And then for the smaller companies, there's a lot of like, we weren't profitable before. We weren't really focused on making money. Now making money is super important. Expenses are super important. And you see a lot of, uh, changes in the way people are thinking about their business now and in the new businesses they want to build. Yeah, in the case uh, where Russ was talking about, you know, what I just was dealing with. So, you know, as, as we all talk about, you know, we do a pickleball show. We do a pickleball podcast called Third Shot. And one of our listeners had reached out to me because he also knows that um, I do this DIY show. And, you know, I work with entrepreneurs and he wanted to kind of bounce an idea off of me. So he was in the blue collar, right? He was a blue collar worker. And unfortunately, due to an injury, he's no longer doing that anymore. He's unable to do that mm. anymore. So he needs to pivot. He needs to do something else. He loves pickleball. He's super passionate about pickleball. And his idea is that he wants to basically hold clinics and classes and go around the country and do these different pickleball clinics. Um, he's never run a business before. 
Um, he doesn't have any kind of marketing background. He's just very passionate about pickleball. You know, for you when you're working with people, you know, how do you help guide them? Uh, because he's doing a complete pivot, right? Yeah. He's, he has no idea what he's doing as far as starting a business or, you know, the travel schedule and like, how does he differentiate himself versus all the other, uh, you know, pickleball coaches out there. So, you know, help me help him. How, how <laughs> would you guide somebody like that in that type of situation? Yeah. I mean, I think there's always three things to think about when you're looking at a change. It's sort of, uh, the environment that the uh, the external environment, your kind of passions and motivations, and you know this the skills and and sort of raw knowledge and expertise you have, right? And you kind of need to find a way to connect all of those together. So, right, pickleball being a kind of growing popular sport, I, I, I mentored a, a a woman who is building out a whole series of, um, I believe it's Wolverine pickleball, and, and it's a whole you know in Michigan and it's building out a, a series of like facilities where. You know, yeah. can do pickleball and like have snacks and drink and it's a watering hole. And, and that, you know, there's a there's a rising tide. And so it's a great opportunity. It's a great time to kind of get involved in something like uh, we were talking about, you know, men's gymnastics, a sport that I was involved in, not necessarily on the uptick. Right. Maybe we're trying to hold hold steady. We'd be happy with that. Pickleball is continuing to become more popular. So so that's a good starting point. Right. Um and then on the other side, you've got uh, your your hard skills. So, you know, you said blue collar worker. Uh, I don't know if that means like plumbing, electrician, like something that's really physical with his hands, but it he might also spend time with customers, right? And you have to negotiate those kinds of things. Or, and if he has that kind of interaction, that's probably good to kind of have some, you know, what has he developed in that world, whether he's had to market himself, whether he's had to, you know, engage with people and, and sort of teach that sometimes that, you know, a, a good contractor will teach you and explain to things about your system for you. Right. And so right. are there transferable skills there? And then ultimately he has to find what he uh, enjoys about this, right? Maybe he enjoys that teaching element. Maybe he wants to do the sort of, right. He'll be the, you know, pickleball contractor. I don't know if there's like enough focus for just pickleball facilities or something, but maybe he could be like, the guy, you know, your guy that you call when when you want to re-outfit uh, a tennis court into a pickleball court. I don't know what's involved in that, right? right? But like, there are different ways that he can apply his skills and what he likes to do to to kind of fit this growing trend of uh, people wanting to play it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Like in in talking about that, we started out with the with the bike messengers, right? Like the bike messengers were so hot back in the the nineties. Like that was that was probably, I mean like like you couldn't almost not get hit uh, by the bike messengers back then <laughs> there were so many of them around and now you know we're saying that there's there's not as many so the folks that were doing that like and now you know like looking at this pickleball thing like pickleball's hot right now what if it's not like greg's getting phone calls for it right now um, I, what I, if know. I mean this yeah, is a hot topic just, people <laughs> trust me but what if it is not hot for a long time what do you do like when you're going into something hot like that, do you want to plan for the pivot in and the pivot out just in case? Or what are you planning for? Or what are you advising businesses for when, when they're just going into something hot like that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the Lindy effect is this law that says that like the longer something's been around, the longer it'll probably be around, right? So pickleball isn't a flash in the pan, right? It's been around for a number of years. It's starting to grow and develop. So it's not something that just broke out on the scene. And, and it means that it won't decline out of nowhere either, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the demographic sort of elements of, you know, folks are getting older. It's a sport that people who might like tennis, but then want to have a smaller play field. Like the, the, there's sort of th factors on your side for the pickleball example in particular, right? right? Um, and I think in general, it, it, we think about entrepreneurship is like getting on the trend, uh, catching the wave early. Uh, but a lot of what we see is actually, you know, Google wasn't the first search engine out there, right? Facebook wasn't the first social network out there, but they, mm -hmm. they kind of built on, on the backs of other companies that kind of were already early and showing that um, there, was, there was value in this area. So not being first is okay, right? And that means that you have time to see that the trend is real. 
Um, right. right. And, and you also have time to let the others make the mistake on their dime and <laughs> you come in with something better. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're that's... following along, right? Yeah, Follow right. along and, and pay mm -hmm. attention and, and take notes. But, um, you know, being first can can also kind of mark you as as a leader and, and give you some some kind of edge. But you have to really I think what matters more is how quickly you can learn. Right. So there's this really great um, paper that studied uh, you know, I think it was like scientists, um, and like uh, inventors and like terrorists, which is a crazy mm -hmm. combo to have in one paper, but it's essentially like those who, uh, were able to iterate off of their failures more quickly in this case, like, uh, a drug or a, uh, invention or a like successful bombing, which is again, horrible, but just to show that this principle works in multiple cases, they, they found that the teams that were able to like most quickly go from one release or attempt uh, at to, to the next one were, were the ones who were able to eventually have that breakthrough. And if it took too much time in between, uh, then you, you, you sort of uh, don't learn fast enough to kind of get to a successful outcome. Um, right. And so, you know, in, in, in all businesses, right, overthinking it is, is usually a mistake. Right. The, the sooner you can get a release cycle out, like I have a client right now that is um, working on a product that takes podcasts and, and cuts it into clips with AI. And, you know, they're they're just at that starting point. There are other companies doing this, too. But it's like, don't don't be embarrassed. Don't feel like, oh, well, we have to make mm -hmm. everything they made and more before we get our thing out there. No, you got to just put it out there. You got to get it yeah. in front of some podcasters and and start yeah. seeing what what what's good about it, right? Yeah, there's right. there's something definitely to be said about failing fast. You know, it's like I I remember, and I actually I just I just uh, I don't know this this will be on Medium at some point. I've started doing some blog posting, um, but uh, one of the articles that I that I've thought about writing is about momentum, right? Because I remember back in my radio days, I'll bring it up again, but back in my radio days, I I switched over from the you know from in front of the mic to behind the mic where I started doing some radio sales because I figured, well, this is where the money is. So let me switch over to there. So there's a, there's a little pivot story for you. Yeah. But when I got my first sale, I was all excited. And I walked into the, the, you know, the manager's office. I'm like, Hey, I got a sale. And he's like, great, go get another one. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> like, where's the confetti? Where's the, yeah, you let's know, celebrate the disco the first lights? One. <laughs> Come on. But he's like, the best time to close is right after you got that. You're, you remember the high, you remember the win, and you've got momentum. So keep moving forward. And I sort of like, it was a lesson for that sale. Like, and I actually did close another deal shortly thereafter, which I'm like, okay, this guy's right. So I, I, I got to go with this. Um, but the momentum thing of like, whether you've failed or whether you've succeeded, if you just keep moving forward, you just keep doing something else. You, 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 you just go with it. It's, it's, I think it's always a good thing. And I think that was um, even when pivoting, right? Like if you're changing something, like just because you have to pivot, that's not a fail. And some people look at that as a, as a fail of like, Oh, I'm going to leave this. And, and, you know, we've talked about that before on the show where, you know, it's not, it's, this didn't work out, but you learned a bunch of lessons and now go do this over here and continue forth. You know, like that's, I think, um, something that, that like needs to be said when you're talking about pivoting, because I feel like so many people do feel like it's, well, I didn't, this didn't work out. So now I'm going to move to this. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to think that if you, like, if you're still doing exactly the same thing you're, as you were doing 10 years ago, you know, you, you haven't been paying attention for, <laughs> you know, you've learned nothing in the right. 10 years that you've been working. Like, did you really know everything you needed to know about what you were doing when you started? Um, <laughs> it just, it's, it's so unlikely and the yeah. world has changed. So if you haven't uh, adapted to that, like that's going to bite you uh, sooner rather than later. Right. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's almost better to kind of uh, confront that, that failure while you still have more time to kind of approach it. And that's one of the things that I talk a lot about in my book, Path to Pivot is this idea that often uh, business owners wait until it's too late to change. It's like once it becomes this extreme, like, oh my gosh, sales are falling off a cliff, you know, mm -hmm. and we, we we're, our finances are really looking tight now and we got to, you know, do something crazy to kind of turn it around. And that can lead to a lot of mistakes as you're under pressure. Whereas if you were able to kind of confront the reality that like, hey, things haven't been looking good for a little while, 
we need to start having conversations sooner about what a change might look like. Doesn't mean we have to immediately go and, and reroute everything, but by confronting the reality that things aren't looking the way we want them to, and they haven't been for a little while, uh, there's a, you, have a, you have more time, right? And you have more space. And I kind of talk about this, this, if you will, this framework, like align, explore, commit, right? And so aligning is that first conversation where you go to your business partners, you go to your founders and you say, you know what? I don't think we're, we're looking so good. I think we should have a, you know, we should look at doing something a little bit more significant and, and let's get everybody on board with that idea that like change may be coming. Um, get everyone on the same page there. Go to your, maybe your investors, your board or whoever else, other stakeholders that are important to you and then like bring it to your team. And then to, to open up this exploration period and sort of definitively say, hey, we're going to spend, you know, is it four weeks, four months, depends on, you know, your resource and your time frame, where we're going to like explicitly put the current thing that we do into the back burner where we sort of maybe run it on maintenance mode, maybe, you know, uh, don't try to do any more marketing, yeah. keep the customers you have, uh, don't build anything new for it, just sort of leave it on, support them, something breaks, go fix it. But just going to mm -hmm. leave that alone for a bit. And then spend the rest of your, you know, hopefully 50 or more percent of your time on some of these new things, whether it's a new marketing channel, whether it's like trying a going for a new audience and saying, hey, we, we, we sell the, to moms right now, let's try selling to dads. What does that look like? How mm -hmm. would our product need to change? How would we need to communicate about it differently? Or, hey, let's try and sub out the material or like do it in a different supplier, do it in a different way that might be cheaper or just better in some way and test these things out. And then have this period at the end where you kind of go back and you say, what have we learned from this? Is anything from here really showing a lot of promise? Maybe the business has done really well. Like sometimes you're overwater a plan and it, and it dies and it's actually better to kind of mm -hmm. like leave it alone. And the business is actually looking better than before. Right. Or, or maybe it's really kind of looking bad. And now it, it, it's like, well, before it's sort of like, yeah, maybe it'll be okay. And, and now you really see like, actually, you know, if we weren't just like, constantly putting something into it that is just like falling away really fast it makes these new opportunities look more little bit, maybe a little bit more attractive and then you can kind of make that decision to to commit to the new direction so having that structure makes everybody feel a little bit better about it as a business owner people are often really entrepreneurial willing to take that risk but your team might have a little bit uh, more of a challenge with that yeah mm -hmm. I, I think it's really fascinating trying to balance that because, you know, in business, you're always worried that if I don't innovate, I'm going to get passed by. But then there's that balance of, well, maybe, like you said, overwatering's too, you know, this is not a good thing. Maybe we should just kind of level out for a bit and let's let everything kind of come to fruition before we continually push forward. So there's always that balance. And I think it's, it's fascinating. And then, you know, earlier we were talking about the pivot. And we're talking about in situations where people are pivoting because maybe one thing they tried didn't quite work out the way they wanted to, so they're pivoting. What I'm dealing with with a lot of people that are kind of my age, I'm mid-50s, is that they're successful. Like they've, they've had mm -hmm. success, but they're kind of like done with that part of their career or that part of their lives. And they want to pivot to do something different and kind of take those experiences, take the knowledge, take the successes they've had and just you know, point it in a different direction and try to pivot that way. It's not like they did anything poorly, you know, they yeah. learned a lot and they just want to do something different. And I'm sure you're working with a lot of people in that situation too, kind of like their second career in a sense. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you guys have worked in radio and you guys know about storytelling and narrative, right? And, and this is really where uh, that those, those ideas come into play because we're always telling stories both to ourselves and to uh, other people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And when we go through that period where it's like, hey, I was really great at this thing and now I'm doing something else. It, you know, sometimes you ask yourself like, why am I doing this? You know, what is, what is my reason for this? And then if, if it doesn't go super well at first, you're like, why did I give up this amazing yeah. thing that I was doing before <laughs> to, to, to like fall flat on my face doing something else, right? Uh, but I think... Uh, th there's like a framework that I uh, that I also like tell people about when I'm working with clients around this 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 shift is kind of doing the um, the like 
season recap of your life. Um, so, right, when we watch TV shows and especially a new season or even a new episode, right, it's often this like, in last season. And then you get right. kind of the highlights <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to go in like, you know, uh, climb that, climb that mountain and whatever. On the other side, there's this big, this big like kingdom and I'm going to, you know, whatever. And along the way, these things that you meet this person and this thing happens. Oh, there's a setback. We got lost at the very end. Like we're, we're like steps away from, from the, 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 the place that we were trying to get to and you fell in a hole. Okay. Or interesting, or, you know, like, or, you know, this other person arrives in the scene at the very end of the, and you're like, now, how, how right. are things going to change now? Right. That's, that's the first, the ending of the first season of Succession. <laughs> I don't know if you watched that. Exactly right. They're like, oh, you almost Spoiler. Got <laughs> tragedy, right? You sabotage yourself. Right. But, but that kind of helps set the scene for, okay, we've met some of the characters. We know some of their motivations. Um, we, we're invested in this uh, goal that they have. And maybe uh, the goal's changed, right? That goal originally was to, to reach this location. And now it's to, to confront this new conflict or um, mm -hmm. something happened in the previous season that has now animating this next season, right? So if, you, if you've had this successful career, that's great. And talk about, right, as you talk about what you're doing now, you should talk about what you did in the past, right? Like I really wanted to become a doctor and pursue this medical career. And I became, you know, a surgical resident and, you know, da, 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 and, and help so many people, you know, get their arms back on. And, but while I was helping them get their arms back on, I realized that like, you know, arms can do lots of, other, I'm, I'm making something on, on the spot here. And, <laughs> and like, you know, what, what people were really coming in for was, was like their tennis elbow and the, this, this injuries that people get and realize like, oh, well, I don't want it to be too late. Right? It's too late now that you, you have to get this surgery. I want to help people before that happens. So now I'm mm -hmm. starting this PT clinic or, you know, if that's, that's a little bit close, but you could imagine something else. I, I met a patient who told me about how much he traveled and I never gotten to travel because I'm always working in the hospital. So I decided to, to travel and then I love it and I can't stop. So I'm starting this YouTube channel about going to various places, right? Like mm -hmm. give us, help us transition both for yourself and then when you tell that story to other people, they're like, oh, got right. it. That's so cool. Right. And and it doesn't just go <laughs> like, yeah, I was a doctor. And then one day I decided to like just start traveling. And you're like, what? I, you're right. so erratic. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, I, I've sort of done that, you know, like I've looked at like the transitions of my career and all these pivots that I've made and all these turns and whatnot. But it like it really does tell a story. Like it tell like about where I am now and how I got here. And it's, it's interesting to do that too. Like that's the other thing. It's almost like looking at your, your family tree or whatever, just seeing the history of those things and seeing what's going on. And, you know, I've talked to my kids about it because I feel like that's a, that's an important thing too, for them mm. to learn. Like, you know, just because what you pick right now, you know, that you're going to go to college for, doesn't mean that that's what you need to do for the rest of your life. You can, you're going to learn lessons. You're going to learn different things and you're going to find things that interest you. And at different parts of your life, you'll find those things interesting. Like for instance, once I had kids, I didn't want to run a business anymore. You know, like I wanted to go coach soccer. And then once I coached soccer, I never wanted to do it again. Um, <laughs> that was crazy. So I pulled back from that and, you know, change, change things around there. But like you experiment, you learn and you grow. And that's, I think, you know, what it's all about. But people don't always naturally think in terms of stories because some, especially, you know, I work with a lot of folks who are very technical and you know, mm -hmm. think about just everything super logically and mathematically and, and so on. And, and they don't necessarily go to that. It, 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 it for some people, it can feel uh, unnatural or uncomfortable to kind of paint it in this lens. And, and so even using that language of like, what, who is this character that we're talking about? You're sort of like creating this thing, right? And what are the mm -hmm. stakes that are, you know, what are they, what are their, what is their goal? What is their obstacle? Uh, what's holding them back? What do they learn along the way, right? Like we have these storytelling tools that we consume in all the, the shows and the, the media that we uh, enjoy, but we don't mm -hmm. uh, always apply it into our own lives. And so I encourage everyone to go and study the basics of, of storytelling, you know, act one, act two, act yeah. three, um, and, and narrative tension, right? Like I've been consuming a lot of that stuff for the last couple of years. And I think it's really nice. important because of uh, it, it's, it's marketing, it's self-marketing as much as it's, um, external marketing. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you guys, 
uh, you know, I, I mean, sure, Greg, I feel like you must also have your own like storytelling, you know, I do. I do. It's really funny that you bring that up because I was just having this conversation with my daughters who one of them just graduated from law school. One of them is finishing uh, her uh, undergraduate degree right now. And we were talking about the skill of communication. And I find that in their generation, the way they communicate is just so different than telling a story, having a conversation, looking people face to face, you know, shaking their hands and that type of thing. Everything's done kind of electronically, you know, kind of what we're doing right now on a, you know, a Zoom conference call or through chat or through social media. I mean, you know, they brought up the example mm -hmm. that nobody breaks up in person anymore. They just break, <laughs> break up through, through chat, right? It's just like, you know, oh, but, man. but there's that <laughs> level of storytelling and communicating that I feel is just different. It's evolving, mm -hmm. it's changing. And I think for, you know, certain people at certain age levels, they need to understand that and they need to adjust to that. Yeah, it's building that range, you know, it's speaking of breakups, I, you know, when I first, I remember moving from DC to New York and I'd been seeing someone in DC and we thought we'd try to do it long distance. And I was like, oh, I don't think this is gonna work. So I actually took the train back to uh, DC to, you know, go to her house and, and break up with her, you know, and it was kind of like a 30 second conversation and then another, <laughs> and then it started snowing and I had to like find a place to stay. Well, and, that, that's old school, uh, Jason. I can't yeah. believe you did that. Gee, I, did the, I went all the way down there because it just didn't seem right, you know, to kind of wow. do that. I don't know if she felt like that was a, a good use of time or like stupid, <laughs> but you know, for me that, that was, that was how I wanted to, to do things. But, um, nice. you know, I, I do like what some of the, the, some of the things that are interesting about the, the younger generation is, is memes and like, and, and TikTok and these short form videos. I am a big fan of some of these ideas because, you know, we think about memes, right? We had these gifts and uh, first it was just like, Oh, I'm going to throw a gift. That's like a hot, you know, it's like from a show or a cartoon or something. And it's like a way to express ourselves. Then it became these like, formats right where it's like you know that we all know the sort of drake like uh mm, you know like that's, <laughs> right. that's like a thing and you can use that to explain all kinds of concepts right like you know day old mm -hmm. coffee fresh ground coffee, you know like whatever right it, yeah. that, that's a way of communicating and then now we have this sort of new format with the video and the memes right and the sound memes where it's like that song like oh no Oh no. Oh, oh yeah. no, no. You know, <laughs> right. and it's like it can do anything. A cake that's falling down, or like, uh -huh. you know, a presentation that accidentally like got all girl, you know, like it can mean anything, but it's now a, a format for us to sort of um communicate in this in this new way, giving us a, like a template uh to communicate in a new way. And that and and so I think we 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 need to help, you know, younger like I'm I'm now uh on the board of this organization called Lunar Excel. And they're they're trying to raise the next generation of Asian American professionals, and you know I'll be probably talking a lot about that in person experience and handshaking and you know right. uh, your 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 body language and posture in in the real world. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to learn from them, right? I'm I'm trying to figure out how to how to stay relevant and and how to continue to understand how communication trends are changing as well. I mean that's the thing you have to evolve. You have to evolve. Otherwise, you know, you are going to kind of be that dinosaur in the room. Right. And you, you yeah. don't want to be that dinosaur. <laughs> well, and, that and, yeah. And, and your business, too. You know, it's the same thing. Like if you're not involving and you're not involving your business and that's that's bad, then the whole thing is the, the, the dinosaur. I don't want to miss out on yeah. the joke, though, Jason. You don't know. Well, I mean, we were we're going to talk about it because it's like the the sort of how AI has really you know infiltrated our lives in the last like year. You know, I mean, I think ChatGPT yeah. came out in like October or November. Like, it hasn't even been a year when we all just went, "Holy smokes!" Mm -hmm. You yep. know, like right. it's here. It's no longer on the shows. It's no longer in the video games. It is here. Yeah. Um, and. But the the new the new like diss is that so and so sounds like an AI, right? Like you talk like an AI. That's like the new diss, right? right. It's short lived, right? Because it you know it's it's it sounds like this now, but it's not going to sound like that forever. And the truth is, uh, if you aren't incorporating some form of this gender of AI into your business now, like it's 
you're going to lose out to people who who are right yeah. because it is a tremendous amount of value and one of the things that's really interesting that i've observed about technology I'd be curious if this lines up with what you, you've all seen is that people who are really skilled at something are the last to adopt the new technology because it kind of punishes the people who are really good at something so like you know i i've worked with editors who are like i will never use this this is so bad and you know like they have some ethical qualms with it which i can appreciate and you know people also had about google when google started scraping all websites and like you know showing snippets of results online but but she's a great writer and a great editor and so she she values that skill in herself whereas people who where english isn't their first language or you know they just were they're, they're focused on these other areas whether it's artistic endeavors or like you know technical endeavors they can benefit they can kind of like raise their bar dramatically right like the um going back to the blue collar guy who maybe he hasn't done a lot of professional emails there are all these like email ai tools where you can just write like write a professional thank you or like write a professional introduction email uh to my services right and it can mm -hmm. do that for you um and that's going to be a huge advantage for people who who figure out how to adopt it so so learning to spend a little bit of your budget even when things are going well even when you're not needing to pivot to like look at this stuff or get a you know some member of your team to look at this stuff for you super important right right yeah, yeah, I think a lot of it has to be with like self-evaluation. Like, are you being real with yourself? And I think a lot of the people that don't want to take advantage of the new technology, they're feeling like, well, I already know this stuff. I don't need the new technology. Where some of the people that, you know, aren't as advanced in a certain topic, they want to take advantage of the new technology because it helps them level up faster. So a lot of it kind of self-evaluation and then you kind of look at it, you know, the, for the person that says, oh, I don't need something new because I'm already good. Well, you should also look at like, can you be better? You know, right. is it worth it to try something different just to experience what's out there? You know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you know, educate yourself, right? Try different things out, experience it, because even if you decide not to use it for whatever reason, at least you understand what other people are using. And you can talk to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a coach, but I have had different coaches in my own life, right? In my 20s, I worked with uh, someone who was just coming out of like a coaching certificate program. In my uh, early 30s, I worked with an uh, entrepreneur slash lawyer who became a coach. And then now I work with another woman who is, you know, was previously a uh, money manager turned executive coach, right? And I've benefited from receiving all of their styles and approaches to uh coaching me and i'm in like you know uh like group coaching programs again because i'm constantly building my own toolkit and 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 i know that i've learned a lot over the the years as i've been a business operator and kind of like studying this stuff on the side but i know that the there's so much more to learn and the the part of why i think people like to transition is because they do kind of feel like I've sort of figured everything else, everything out, or there's nothing interesting here for me. And going yeah. somewhere where you just don't know anything is a huge learning curve. It, right. it will yeah. involve falling on your face, but you fell on your face when you started the other thing too, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think it's like, it's, it's fun to explore, you know, like if it's like, if you went to the va same vacation spot every single year, okay, well, that's, you know, every, where everything is like, as a kid, I would go to Disneyland all the time. Mm. Right. I know, I know where everything is in Disneyland. You need to know where the water fountain is or the bathroom. I'm your guy. But like, that meant that I didn't go and explore other things and learn these other things and have these other experiences. And, and I think that that's like, so important. Um, and one thing that we were talking about earlier, and, and, and sort of bringing this into some kind of nerdy data stuff, your, your data is also telling a story. Right. So looking at I remember I remember going through um, uh, and, and this was a story that I just told the other day to somebody when we were we were chatting about data. Like I was trying to figure out a new service to offer my clients. I went through the data and I was like figuring that out by looking at the different needs of the clients and the data, like what they what they were looking for, what their event was like, because I was I was doing events at the time and I figured out a new service to offer and offered it and it was successful. And, you know, it's there's my company uh, that I've sold now is still doing that service all because I learned 
you know, a little story from the data. So I, I think that there's different ways to create that story and, and look at that story and learn and figure yeah. out like what's next for you and, and for your business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's like, a, I, I really like this um, approach that uh, the, the folks from superhuman uh, email, the email service, um, mm -hmm. they developed to kind of help uh, companies figure out like what's working with their business and what should they improve. And it, it really, it's a, sort of like this data driven approach. And it starts with, you know, how disappointed would you be if you couldn't use our service? It's like a common question, right? right? Like not really somewhat a lot. And then you, and then the next question is like, what's the number one thing that we do for you? Right. And by, and, and what he says is you got to focus on the people who, uh, who, who really love it and what they say they love about it. Right don't forget to keep doubling down on that. So start there, right? Uh, and advertise that and, and kind of keep investing in that. Then the next question, is, what is the number one thing we could do to make this better for you? And then, you know, again, you want to go to those people who already are satisfied, right? Uh, and, and sort of think about what to fix. And then the third thing they say is like, um, who do you think are the best users of this product? Which they're basically going to do is describe themselves, um, <laughs> because, you know, that's, that's, right. you know, instead of saying yeah. like, describe yourself, just say like, who, who do you think is going to be oh busy people or people who really want this or care right. about why? And so they, they, it's interesting because we often want to think about like what's wrong with what we're making, but it's almost like, how do we make what we're doing right? Even more right before we start to worry about like, oh, what else could we add? Um, and mm -hmm. so it's like, how do you make it even faster? And then it, that was like the that was like the email thing that they figured out, right? And then it was these other things like, okay, a mobile app would be good, or this other thing would be good. Um, but don't take the feedback from people who don't really like your service, right? Like if they yeah. don't really like it, yeah, it's irrelevant. What you think is irrelevant, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, right. it's true. Yeah. So, so Jason, as come, you kind of wind down here, tell everybody a little bit about Path to Pivot, your book. Uh, you know, what can people expect when they pick this book up? Yeah, so Path to Pivot was really uh, born out of the fact that I had started three different companies. I had attempted to pivot the first one. It failed and my pivot failed. And then the second time around, I kind of like pieced some things together, made that pivot happen by the skin of our teeth. And eventually we had this exit to, to Facebook, um, which was which was great. But I felt like there's just not a lot of information out there about how to do a pivot off for, you know, there's so much information about how to hire a team or how to raise money for your company or how to build a, you know, successful product. But there wasn't a lot about this pivot, even though it's something that we talk so much about. Instagram mm -hmm. was a pivot. Lyft was a pivot. Slack was a pivot. I mean, all these companies that we know about were, were often pivots. And yet there's not a lot of research or, or sort of like a playbook. On this, so mm. I I decided I kind of like learned enough from all this that I want to put everything I know in one place, and it's not going to be everything, but it's going to be uh, a lot of grounded experience. And so it, I put it together in three different buckets. So the part one is it's actually a business fable. You remember those? Like let we're, I'm bringing those back. <laughs> yeah, right. <nice. laughs> um, so we follow like these two characters, uh, Keith and Karma Carmelin who have started a, a fitness tech company and they kind of hit this, you know, stalled out point two years in and there's a competitor that's really growing and they're not. And it's like, what's going on? And so they actually have to kind of figure out how to pivot their business. And then kind of as the chapters go by, I intersperse that with some of the more tactical information of like, all right, here's where they're at. Here's how you can know whether a pivot is something you should be thinking about exploring okay, here they're, they need to like communicate this to their investors before their team, right? And this is the order of how you do it, right? So you sort of like, you know, after each kind of part of the story, we kind of break it down. And then the last thing, you know, that's in the book that I'm really excited about is a series of case studies from different companies that have pivoted, right? Like mm -hmm. the Twitch, right? From Justin TV to Twitch to the Amazon acquisition, you know, that was like a zoom mm -hmm. in pivot where they really doubled yeah. down on the video gaming uh, experience. Lyft, which I mentioned before, we my first company competed with the parent company of Lyft where they were doing long distance and carpooling. Uh, and they were like, it was like an enterprise B2B play. And then they decided to get into this like real time intracity ride sharing. So that, they, that was an interesting pivot, right? And so breaking those down and helping them people understand like, what were they doing originally? 
you know, what made them realize that there was something else to be done, you know, how long did that pivot take? And then where did it end up, right? And what lessons can we learn from it? So, so by breaking those down for people, I think they get to under, feel less alone, like, hey, I'm, I'm just this crazy person trying to figure out how to totally <laughs> reboot my business and, and realize that you're part of like a whole legacy of, of entrepreneurial individuals uh, and business owners who, who yeah. have reinvented themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, Greg is the one that came up with our, our kind of tagline to our uh, show here, which is, uh, you know, DIY for business where you are not alone. Because I think I think it nails it with like you do feel uh, this this sense of loneliness when you're working. I mean, you're literally like when you're starting out, you are just working by yourself. It's just you. You're yeah. everything, and then it grows into these bigger things. And even 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 the startups, even the big startups that that do this. I think Justin TV wasn't that just some guy named Justin that started that. Like Justin and Emmett, right? there's two of them. Yeah. Oh, okay, two, two of them. But still, but, I mean, yeah, you know, Small. they're they're alone. Yeah. Yeah. And the weight of being a business owner, you know, yeah. like even when mm -hmm. you are surrounded by a team, if you're surrounded by people who depend on you for a paycheck, yeah. It, yeah. You, you don't you necessarily want to yeah. Yeah, go to them and talk about everything. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, that's that's why I've got Greg, my counselor here. Uh, <laughs> <with everything. laughs> I'm there for well, you. You are not alone, Russ. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, uh, Jason, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and, uh, you know, we've we've uh, mentioned the book uh, uh, available on Amazon, I'm assuming. Yeah. By the time this podcast comes out uh, in, you know, a couple of weeks, it'll be available for pre-order. Uh, I'm targeting sort of uh, mid uh late october for okay. the, the full release um you can find out more at jasonshen.com slash diy for business um so that we'll make that link just for for listeners to awesome. this show and we'll kind of reference whatever we were talking about in the show and make that all good and gravy awesome good. gotta thank love you. that yeah thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for having me greg russ <laughs> Great talking to you, Jason. Yeah, yeah. And uh, thank you for listening, subscribing, and reviewing DIY for Business on your favorite podcast platform. And also over there on YouTube, you get to see my crazy hat and all the stuff that we chat about here. <laughs> uh, the subjects that we cover on this podcast are selected with the goal of helping your business grow. All of the information provided is opinion-based, and you might want to consult a professional to discuss your exact business situation. Greg and I want your company to succeed, and we're happy to take your questions. We'd love to hear suggestions for future episodes as well. You can do so. So uh, uh, get those done, get those questions answered, get those new shows on by just reaching out to us. Head over to our website, DIYforbusinesspodcast.com. Um, and if you're just a business owner that wants to chat, like that's fun too. So we would love to have you on the show. So do reach out. And I'm going to go with the tagline here, Greg. We thank you again for listening and subscribing to DIY for Business, where you are not alone.